University of Cambridge International Examinations, International General Certificate of Secondary Education, November Examination Session 2012, English as a Second Language, Extended Tier, Listening Comprehension. Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the test. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the test. Teacher, please give out the question papers, and when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the test. Look at questions 1 to 6. For each question, you will hear the situation described as it is on your exam paper. You will hear each item twice. Questions 1 to 6. For questions 1 to 6, you will hear a series of short sentences. Answer each question on the line provided. Your answer should be as brief as possible. You will hear each item twice. Question 1. How do the friends decide to save time? Here's a map of the island. We are meeting Matteo at 12 here at the southernmost point. Easy. Let's cycle due south then. We're already late. It's 10 minutes to 12. But the road follows the coast around the island. It doesn't lead straight across it. Cycle paths are shown too. Let's try and follow the cycle paths instead of the road to save us time and miles. Here's a map of the island. We are meeting Matteo at 12 here at the southernmost point. Easy. Let's cycle due south then. We're already late. It's 10 minutes to 12. But the road follows the coast around the island. It doesn't lead straight across it. Cycle paths are shown too. Let's try and follow the cycle paths instead of the road to save us time and miles. Question 2. What are the two disadvantages of catching a direct train? When does the train to Ho City leave, please? Can I travel direct or do I need to change trains? There's a train leaving in five minutes from Platform 8. You will need to change trains and platforms twice for that one. You can wait and catch the direct train from Platform 11, but it's not due for 58 minutes and there's extra to pay for that service. When does the train to Ho City leave, please? Can I travel direct or do I need to change trains? There's a train leaving in five minutes from Platform 8. You will need to change trains and platforms twice for that one. You can wait and catch the direct train from Platform 11, but it's not due for 58 minutes and there's extra to pay for that service. Question 3. What should the guests do after visiting the lighthouse and why is Tuesday best for the trip? Andrew, where can we take our PEM friends when they come to stay for the school exchange visit? I'd suggest a harbour trip, Peter. You can show them the whole coastline from there. 
Walk up to the top of the lighthouse on the rocks at the edge of the harbour. That's a good idea, Andrew. We can end the day at the cafe on the quay, where you get on the boat. Yes, Peter. And if you go on a Tuesday, there's a firework display in the evening too. Andrew, where can we take our PEM friends when they come to stay for the school exchange visit? I'd suggest a harbour trip, Peter. You can show them the whole coastline from there. Walk up to the top of the lighthouse on the rocks at the edge of the harbour. That's a good idea, Andrew. We can end the day at the cafe on the quay, where you get on the boat. Yes, Peter. And if you go on a Tuesday, there's a firework display in the evening too. Question 4. What is the emergency contact number? The dental surgery is now closed. Our opening hours are weekdays between 9am and 4pm. For emergency treatment out of hours and at weekends, Please telephone 0888 3244 943. The dental surgery is now closed. Our opening hours are weekdays between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. For emergency treatment out of hours and at weekends, please telephone 0888 3244 943. Question 5. Which subject does Mark choose for his book review? And where will he find the book? Mrs Smith. I need to choose, read and review a book for my English homework. Can you help me, please? Certainly, Mark. Tell me what type of books you like. Adventures? Biographies? Mysteries? No, none of those, really. I'm only interested in racing cars. We have lots of books about racing cars. They are on the second shelf of the third bookcase. Help yourself, Mark. Mrs Smith, I need to choose, read and review a book for my English homework. Can you help me, please? Certainly, Mark. Tell me what type of books you like. Adventures? Biographies? Mysteries? No. None of those, really. I'm only interested in racing cars. We have lots of books about racing cars. They are on the second shelf of the third bookcase. Help yourself, Mark. Question 6. Which solution does the customer choose, and why? Can you help me? I bought this radio from you yesterday for £9.99. I switched it on, but it doesn't work. There must be a fault with it. I can give you a cash refund or another radio. We sell a better one for £10.50. I'll take that £10.50 one, please, as I need to listen to a special concert today. I'll need to pay you 51 pence extra. Can you help me? I bought this radio from you yesterday for £9.99. I switched it on, but it doesn't work. There must be a fault with it. I can give you a cash refund or another radio. We sell a better one for £10.50. I'll take that £10.50 one, please, as I need to listen to a special concert today. 
I'll need to pay you 51 pence extra. That is the last of questions 1 to 6. In a moment, you will hear question 7. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 7. Listen to the following interview with a table tennis trainer and then complete the details below. You will hear the interview twice. Hello and welcome to Sports Weekly. We've been hearing recently about sports projects throughout the world. This week our focus is on table tennis. Celine Kaya, table tennis star, is here in the studio to tell us more. 2012 is an Olympic year. Sports teams all round the world trained for this huge event. My own involvement has been with the Ping Worldwide table tennis project. That sounds interesting. How has that project helped to promote the status of table tennis as a world sport? Branches of this international project have promoted table tennis in many countries. Ping Australia and Ping UK are two examples. I think I've heard about that project. Didn't you set up tables in parks and at train stations? Your aim was to encourage commuters on their way to work, shoppers and tourists, to play table tennis. Yes, that was in 2010. Celebrities played games of table tennis to give us more publicity. You probably read about us in the newspapers. You might well have played on the open-air tables in Hyde Park, London, right by the Serpentine Lake. I did. Luckily, it wasn't raining. <laughs> it was good that you provided bats and balls for us, too. We provided equipment with a label on saying, please return after use, and it seemed to work. Have there been other projects like yours? Yes, but they were mainly art and music projects. There were painted animals in capital cities around the world. Then, in summer 2009, there were 30 pianos placed around London with a sign saying, Play me, I'm yours, to encourage an interest in playing instruments and music. All these projects were very successful, but my aim has been to promote table tennis. Celine, well done. Thank you. We even organised a match with teams from two rival rail companies at one main station. <laughs> Explain your own role within the project for us, please. I have been very privileged to be appointed team coach for a squad of young Olympians. This role has involved a lot of travel and much intensive work, but the reward of the job is seeing the progress of the young players. What advice could you give to anyone interested in training in table tennis for the next Olympics? Visit the website playtabletennis.com to find local clubs coaching and tournaments. Most importantly, just play table tennis on a ping worldwide table in the park or even on your desk or on your kitchen table. It's all good training. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello and welcome to Sports Weekly. We've been hearing recently about sports projects throughout the world. This week our focus is on table tennis. 
Celine Kaya, table tennis star, is here in the studio to tell us more. 2012 is an Olympic year. Sports teams all round the world trained for this huge event. My own involvement has been with the Ping Worldwide table tennis project. That sounds interesting. How has that project helped to promote the status of table tennis as a world sport? Branches of this international project have promoted table tennis in many countries. Ping Australia and Ping UK are two examples. I think I've heard about that project. Didn't you set up tables in parks and at train stations? Your aim was to encourage commuters on their way to work, shoppers and tourists, to play table tennis. Yes, that was in 2010. Celebrities played games of table tennis to give us more publicity. You probably read about us in the newspapers. You might well have played on the open air tables in Hyde Park, London, right by the Serpentine Lake. I did. Luckily, it wasn't raining. <laughs> it was good that you provided bats and balls for us too. We provided equipment with a label on saying, "Please return after use," and it seemed to work. Have there been other projects like yours? Yes, but they were mainly art and music projects. There were painted animals in capital cities around the world. Then, in summer two thousand and nine, there were thirty pianos placed around London with a sign saying "Play me, I'm yours" to encourage an interest in playing instruments and music. All these projects were very successful. But my aim has been to promote table tennis. Celine, well done. Thank you. We even organised a match with teams from two rival rail companies at one main station. <laughs> Explain your own role within the project for us, please. I have been very privileged to be appointed team coach for a squad of young Olympians. This role has involved a lot of travel. And much intensive work, but the reward of the job is seeing the progress of the young players. What advice could you give to anyone interested in training in table tennis for the next Olympics? Visit the website playtabletennis.com to find local clubs, coaching, and tournaments. Most importantly, just play table tennis. On a ping worldwide table in the park, or even on your desk, or on your kitchen table, it's all good training. That is the end of question seven. In a moment, you will hear question eight. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question eight. Listen to the following interview with an explorer, and then complete the details below. You will hear the interview twice. Hello, and welcome to our monthly world records report. With us in the studio is Ed Stafford, who made the news headlines in two thousand and ten. Yes. I was the first person to walk the length of the Amazon River in South America. I walked from its source in the mountains to its mouth at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. That sounds a long way. How long did it take you? Eight hundred and fifty-nine days.、Oh, that is a long time.
I set out on the 2nd of April 2008 and finished on the 9th of August 2010. You walked for more than two years then. How did you prepare yourself physically for a walk that would take so long to carry out? Well, I had been a captain in the army, so I was used to physical challenges. The Amazon is the world's second longest river. The Nile in Egypt is the longest, of course. Mm. And I was preparing to tackle the 6,400 kilometer length of the Amazon. So I underwent appropriate training. Did you walk exactly 6,400 kilometers? No. I had planned that the walk would take me one year. Heavy floods meant that I had to walk a roundabout route along the river. I ended up walking an extra 3,200 kilometers, and I was away for 18 months longer than I had planned. So, where was your starting point back in 2008? I started at the source of the Amazon, on the peak of Mount Mismi in Peru. Did you aim to use the walk for any purpose other than setting a world record? Oh yes. My actual aim was to raise money for several charities, such as Cancer Research, Project for Peru and Action for Brazil's Children. Did you make a documentary or broadcast reports while you were walking? Yes, I did. And I used a satellite to keep a blog and a video diary about the progress of the trek. You can still follow this at walkingtheamazon.com. I also wanted to raise awareness of the threats to the Amazonian rainforests and its people. I think I have achieved this aim through all the publicity generated by my walk. How did you eat? Surely there weren't shops en route. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. I'm trained in survival in the wild, and my diet for two and a half years was spider monkeys, snakes, piranha fish, eels, scorpions and ants. Oh, that doesn't sound very pleasant. <laughs> was your health okay? Generally, yes although I did contract some sort of skin disease and had to ask for first aid advice via the satellite. Did you walk alone? Some of the time, yes. I began with a colleague and then walked alone for a couple of months. Then Cho, a local forestry worker, agreed to walk with me for five days and thankfully he stayed until the end of the trek. He became your guide and helper, didn't he? Oh, yes. I couldn't have managed without him. And no one makes coffee like Cho does. <laughs> what happened when you reached the mouth of the Amazon River? I dived into the Atlantic Ocean to prove that I had finished. That was at 9am on the 10th of August 2010. I had survived attacks by hostile tribes, mosquito bites and tropical disease. Well done for completing it. Ed, Thank you for talking to us about your record-breaking walk. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello, and welcome to our monthly World Records Report. With us in the studio is Ed Stafford, who made the news headlines in 2010. Yes, I was the first person to walk the length of the Amazon River in South America. I walked from its source in the mountains to its mouth at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. That sounds a long way. How long did it take you? 859 days. Oh, that is a long time. I set out on the 2nd of April 2008 and finished on the 9th of August 2010. You walked for more than two years then. How did you prepare yourself physically for a walk that would take so long to carry out? Well, I had been a captain in the army, so I was used to physical challenges. 
The Amazon is the world's second longest river. The Nile in Egypt is the longest, of course.、Mm. And I was preparing to tackle the six thousand four hundred kilometer length of the Amazon, so I underwent appropriate training. Did you walk exactly six thousand four hundred kilometers? No, I had planned that the walk would take me one year. Heavy floods meant that I had to walk a roundabout route along the river. I ended up walking an extra three thousand two hundred kilometers. And I was away for eighteen months longer than I had planned. So, where was your starting point back in two thousand and eight? I started at the source of the Amazon, on the peak of Mount Mismi in Peru. Did you aim to use the walk for any purpose other than setting a world record? Oh yes, my actual aim was to raise money for several charities, such as Cancer Research. Project for Peru and Action for Brazil's Children. Did you make a documentary or broadcast reports while you were walking? Yes, I did, and I used a satellite to keep a blog and a video diary about the progress of the trek. You can still follow this at walkingtheamazon dot com. I also wanted to raise awareness of the threats to the Amazonian rainforests and its people. I think I have achieved this aim through all the publicity generated by my walk. How did you eat? Surely there weren't shops en route. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. I'm trained in survival in the wild, and my diet for two and a half years was spider monkeys, snakes, piranha fish, eels. Scorpions and ants.、Oh, that doesn't sound very pleasant. Was your health okay? Generally, yes. Although I did contract some sort of skin disease, and had to ask for first aid advice via the satellite. Did you walk alone? Some of the time, yes. I began with a colleague and then walked alone for a couple of months. Then Cho, a local forestry worker, agreed to walk with me for five days. And thankfully, he stayed until the end of the trek. He became your guide and helper, didn't he? Oh yes, I couldn't have managed without him. And no one makes coffee like Cho does. <laughs> What happened when you reached the mouth of the Amazon River? I dived into the Atlantic Ocean to prove that I had finished. That was at 9 a.m. on the 10th of August, 2010. I had survived attacks by hostile tribes. Mosquito bites and tropical disease. Well done for completing it, Ed. Thank you for talking to us about your record-breaking walk. That is the end of question eight. In a moment, you will hear question nine. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question nine. Listen to the following interview about a huge crab, and then answer the questions below. You will hear the interview twice. Welcome to our wildlife program. Today we are at the Sea Life Centre, and our focus is the Pacific Ocean, or more specifically, three hundred meters under it. Gabby Garcia is with us to tell us more. Hello, I'm Gabby Garcia, and I am the director of this Sea Life Centre. What is a Sea Life Centre, Gabby? 
you can find our centres all over the world. We aim to bring the mysteries of the oceans to your doorstep. Visit us and you can handle an octopus, see a shark at close quarters and learn many facts about the undersea world. And your centre has a new addition. Yes, our new visitor is a 1.5 metre long, 20 kilogram crab. Now that's almost as tall as you. Our Japanese spider crab is the largest ever found. And it is visiting our centre for a short time. So come and see it for yourself. It sounds huge. It is. We've called the crab Crabzilla. <laughs> <laughs> like the famous cartoon lizard monster Godzilla. This is because of the crab's size and because it comes from the sea around Japan, which was also Godzilla's home. For how long is the Japanese spider crab staying at your centre, Gabby? It will be with us until next March when it'll be taken to its permanent home. Oh, so we have a bit of time yet. Mm. Tell us about these huge crabs. Are we likely to meet one when paddling in the sea? <laughs> I doubt it. These crabs usually live in deep water, about 300 metres below the surface of the Pacific Ocean, or even deeper. Are they always that size? This species of crab can grow wide enough to be able to grab and pick up a car, just like in a monster film. <laughs> but what about the other crabs in your sea life centre? Won't they be worried by the arrival of the monster Japanese spider crab? <laughs> no, I don't think so. He's a gentle giant, not aggressive, and he won't eat them. What does such a crab eat? Humans? <laughs> the crab usually eats seaweed, small fish, plants and sea snails. Can you describe its appearance, please? I'm worried I might meet one. <laughs> <laughs> it has ten legs like all crabs, two of which are used for feeding. These have pincers with rows of teeth on them which are used to catch and tear up food. Oh dear! Do they ever come on land? Sometimes. You will know if you meet one. Its body is dark orange and there are white spots on its legs. The crab's eyes are at the front of its body, with two short horns between them. Do people eat spider crabs? Yes. They are enjoyed for their delicious taste. Won't they become endangered? Fishermen are forbidden from catching them in the spring when they lay their eggs. Does any animal species hunt the spider crab or is it too big for that? Actually, other animals do hunt these crabs and we have seen spider crabs cover themselves with sponges and small sea creatures in order to hide from large predators. How clever! Gabby, thank you for talking to us. We'll visit your centre soon. Now you will hear the interview again. Welcome to our wildlife program. Today we are at the Sea Life Center and our focus is the Pacific Ocean, or more specifically, 300 meters under it. Gabby Garcia is with us to tell us more. Hello, I'm Gabby Garcia and I am the director of this Sea Life Center. What is a sea life centre, Gabby? 
you can find our centers all over the world. We aim to bring the mysteries of the oceans to your doorstep. Visit us and you can handle an octopus, see a shark at close quarters, and learn many facts about the undersea world. And your center has a new addition. Yes, our new visitor is a 1.5 meter long, 20 kilogram crab. Now that's almost as tall as you. Our Japanese spider crab is the largest ever found. And it is visiting our center for a short time. So come and see it for yourself. It sounds huge. It is. We've called the crab Crabzilla. <laughs> <laughs> like the famous cartoon lizard monster Godzilla. This is because of the crab's size and because it comes from the sea around Japan, which was also Godzilla's home. For how long is the Japanese spider crab staying at your center, Gabby? It will be with us until next March, when it'll be taken to its permanent home. Oh, so we have a bit of time yet. Mm. Tell us about these huge crabs. Are we likely to meet one when paddling in the sea? <laughs> I doubt it. These crabs usually live in deep water, about 300 meters below the surface of the Pacific Ocean, or even deeper. Are they always that size? This species of crab can grow wide enough to be able to grab and pick up a car, just like in a monster film. <laughs> but what about the other crabs in your sea life center? Won't they be worried by the arrival of the monster Japanese spider crab? <laughs> no, I don't think so. He's a gentle giant, not aggressive, and he won't eat them. What does such a crab eat? Humans? <laughs> the crab usually eats seaweed, small fish, plants, and sea snails. Can you describe its appearance, please? I'm worried I might meet one. <laughs> it has ten legs like all crabs, two of which are used for feeding. These have pincers with rows of teeth on them, which are used to catch and tear up food. Oh dear. Do they ever come on land? Sometimes. You will know if you meet one. Its body is dark orange and there are white spots on its legs. The crab's eyes are at the front of its body, with two short horns between them. Do people eat spider crabs? Yes. They are enjoyed for their delicious taste. Won't they become endangered? Fishermen are forbidden from catching them in the spring when they lay their eggs. Does any animal species hunt the spider crab or is it too big for that? Actually, other animals do hunt these crabs, and we have seen spider crabs cover themselves with sponges and small sea creatures in order to hide from large predators. How clever! Gabby, thank you for talking to us. We'll visit your centre soon. That is the end of question 9. In a moment, you will hear question 10. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam.
Question 10. Listen to the following talk by a writer and then answer the questions below. You will hear the talk twice. I'm a writer of detective fiction and I've published a series of books featuring my own detective hero. I've written 26 of these novels and sold more than 20 million copies. I've even won a Crime Writers Award. Imagine my surprise and joy when I was invited to write the next novel about the famous English spy, James Bond. I was to become the next 007 author. James Bond, 007, is a household name all round the world. Bond books and films are still widely read and watched, and there are Bond websites and fan clubs. When Bond's creator died, the tradition of books was carried on by writers invited by his surviving family. The last James Bond book was published in 2008, the centenary of the author's birth, and was set in the 1960s over a longish period of time. My own novel will be up to date and the action will all happen over a short period of time. I've had a close connection with James Bond for over 50 years. I was eight when I read my first Bond novel. From then on, I read every one published. I thank my parents for that. They restricted what I watched on TV, but they allowed me to read anything I wished to. So, I read my father's Bond novels. When I was 11 years old, I wrote a mini-novel about a spy, based on the James Bond novels I had read, with my American father as the hero secret agent. In fact, my early reading really decided the type of book, that is, detective fiction, which I would eventually write. If you are an aspiring writer, then I urge you to read, read and read in order to see which branch of fiction, or indeed non-fiction, interests you most. It could be adventure, biography, crime, or specialist books, perhaps. Once you have decided what to write, then read as much as you possibly can before trying to write your own story. As a writer, I know that my strength must be to engage the reader. I need to produce a plot over a short time frame, as I like the action in my novels to happen within a period of between eight and 48 hours. I also include lots of twists in the plot and I create suspense so that my readers want to continue reading. Now you will hear the talk again. I'm a writer of detective fiction and I've published a series of books featuring my own detective hero. I've written 26 of these novels and sold more than 20 million copies. I've even won a Crime Writers Award. Imagine my surprise and joy when I was invited to write the next novel about the famous English spy, James Bond. I was to become the next 007 author. James Bond, 007, is a household name all round the world. Bond books and films are still widely read and watched, 
and there are Bond websites and fan clubs. When Bond's creator died, the tradition of books was carried on by writers invited by his surviving family. The last James Bond book was published in 2008, the centenary of the author's birth, and was set in the 1960s over a longish period of time. My own novel will be up to date, and the action will all happen over a short period of time. I've had a close connection with James Bond for over 50 years. I was eight when I read my first Bond novel. From then on, I read every one published. I thank my parents for that. They restricted what I watched on TV, but they allowed me to read anything I wished to. So, I read my father's Bond novels. When I was 11 years old, I wrote a mini-novel about a spy, based on the James Bond novels I had read, with my American father as the hero secret agent. In fact, my early reading really decided the type of book, that is, detective fiction, which I would eventually write. If you are an aspiring writer, then I urge you to read, read and read in order to see which branch of fiction, or indeed non-fiction, interests you most. It could be adventure, biography, crime, or specialist books, perhaps. Once you have decided what to write, then read as much as you possibly can before trying to write your own story. As a writer, I know that my strength must be to engage the reader. I need to produce a plot over a short time frame, as I like the action in my novels to happen within a period of between eight and 48 hours. I also include lots of twists in the plot, and I create suspense so that my readers want to continue reading. That is the end of question 10 and of the test. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.